was like, ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah When I press play, all I hear is you And it goes like, ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah When I press play, all I hear is you Oh, every single song tells me we're through Yeah, but I can't turn it off cause it's the truth Welcome to the third day of the Affluence Human Rights Festival 2023. 
Um, today's panel discussion will be, um, the subjects of discussion will be being your own conceptual jeweler and uh, we'll be discussing visual arts. We want to know how is creativity and artistic practice speaking to the souls of South Africans and redefining, reawakening and redeveloping hope. So joining me will be two lovely ladies, Garabo and Balegani Lehoabe. Nice to meet you ladies. Um, Hello. I'd love for you Hi, I'd love for you to, you know, quickly introduce yourselves, who you are, what you do, um, and then we'll um, go into a uh, discussion. Take it from there. Okay, I'm Karabo Lukwabe. I am a production designer, so I specialize in set design. I'm also a producer and an arts manager. I'm the operations manager and producer at UJ Arts and Culture, and I freelance as a production designer and art director. Thank you. Balegani. Hi, my name is Balegani. I am saying that right, right? I'm sorry. It's Balegani, yes. Balegani, yeah. My name is Balegani Lohwabe. I happen to be Garabo's youngest sister. Um, and I am a visual artist. I am, my background is in illustration and 2D animation and I do freelance in both of those areas and then I am also an art teacher for small children as well as a Reiki therapist. Thank you ladies and so um, to open the conversation um, I'd like to discuss how each of you the process of your work um, how each of you um, you know, birth an idea or the seed of an idea into a fully realized um, work and how um, you interpret a commissioned work in through a conceptual lens um, and how, oh, sorry, and how you patiently bring that to life. I also want you to discuss um, how the demands of today as artists um, how you navigate those because um, you know uh, you are pressured to work quickly for social media and um, for sales. And so, how do you keep you know your process of developing an idea? Those demands. You want to go first? Sure. Um, I'll answer first. So, in terms of me, um, okay. Wait, I just want to make sure. First question was. How do I kind of come up with my ideas, my concepts? Um, so yes. for me, it's an incredibly intuitive process. It's very like low pressure outside of my creative practice, just the way that I am. I'm kind of very structured, very organized. I like schedules. So my practice is kind of the place where I just allow myself to um, break loose from that so I never really put my, put pressure on myself to have a specific idea or a specific concept I'll just start working and then um, you know whatever is embedded in my subconscious at the time will start to come out and then I will make sense of what I'm creating as I'm working and then in terms of like approaching commissioned work I mean, it's different every time, you know, sometimes someone will come to me and they'll be like, hey, I really like, you know, this, this and this. Can you make me something similar? Then I can do that. Sometimes I like to have a chat with clients, you know, if it's just like more of an abstract work that they want in their home, see what's important to them, see what they value and try and embed those elements into the work that I'm creating. And I think that's where my design background is very helpful because in like design industry, you oftentimes have a brief that you have to follow. So the artistic process still reigns, but, you know, when there's a clients in the background, then I, I do, I have the ability to um, approach it a little bit as if it were a design project. And then in terms of like the pressures of producing, so there were two sort of avenues that you referred to, it was social media as well as um, just like work, 
sales, yes, social media and sales. So in terms of like sales, that's a little bit difficult because it's, you know, it all comes about very sporadically. It's not consistent and you don't know how long it's going to, it's going to stay, you know, so it's very, you, you oftentimes, especially for me as an emerging artist in the beginning of my career, I, it's very difficult to turn down work, but then I think that's where boundaries comes in. Boundaries come in, and you can clarify to clients that, like, listen, I'm working on one, two, three. Do you mind waiting, you know, a little bit longer, or whatever? But really, just setting the parameters for yourself. Otherwise, it's going to take away from the creative process. And then, in terms of social media, I also think that boundaries need to be set and to a certain degree it is also a choice you know you can you choose whether or not you you share on social media and I think as an artist that's where you have to over time leverage what the value is of constantly sharing and constantly producing versus reserving your work and then showing it in real life at an exhibition or whatever and then sharing to social media you must leverage and see what's more successful and what works best over time yeah thank you Thurabo oh what was the first question again so how do you like conception idea yes oh, okay okay cool so with me with my creative practice okay cool it's it's nine out of 10 times really dictated to by the script and by the story. So my job as a set designer is to create a world and it's to create a world um, that the director wants and that will be practical for the director. With that said, there's a lot of creative license in that. Um, but, um, you know, it, and, and that really depends on the story. Once again, it depends on the, the space that I'm creating, the people who live and who exist in that space, um, the, the time period of the story. So if it's a period piece, uh, I, I generally specialize in period pieces. I didn't choose this. I can't, can't just fall into that. So if it's something that's set in the 40s or the 50s, you know, um, that will also um, dictate what conceptually I'm going to come up with. So it has, so I do a lot of research to come up with my original ideas. I do research about the period, research about people, authors, the story, sometimes a little bit research about the director themselves that I'm working with and looking at their previous work. And, you know, because sometimes with some directors, stylistically, you can kind of see the kind of things that they like. My concept is also quite restricted by budget because yeah. um, obviously if, if, a set that I'm going to build with a 10,000 rand budget and a set that I'm going to build with a 100,000 rand budget are completely different. And it's very important to me for whoever my client is to disclose what the budget is from the get-go. Usually if I'm working with someone and they don't want to tell me what the budget is, then I don't take the job because it's, it's really, really time consuming for me to sit down and to build a model. It usually takes me at least eight hours um, so I don't want to go and do my research and then design, 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 and then come back and be like, this is going to be 80,000 rand. And you're like, oh, I only have 10,000 rand. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, I've also got those restrictions from the budget and I'm very cognizant of it. But with that said, um, I, I found that a low budget always just forces you to be more creative because I've never allowed a budget to put me in a position where I create work that I'm not proud of. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's straddling, but the concept usually originates and comes from the script and whatever it is that I'm creating for my director. The second question was um, uh, the demands of artists today in terms of, you know, sales and, and social media, making work quickly, those demands, how do you navigate them? How do you protect your artistic process and your um, ideas? I mean, I, unlike Balikani, I generally, working in theater and creating and building sets for theater is usually a high pressure uh, thing. You know, I usually have four weeks to do everything. So I'll usually take around a week to do research um, and concept. Sometimes I do a lot of dream work as well. So I'll dream about my sets, um, especially if it's something where 
nine out of 10 times it sets there's a problem or there's something that you need to resolve. So like that will sometimes the solution will come in my dreams. Um, and then social media. And the thing is the industry that I work in as a set designer, we get, we get our jobs by word of mouth. I can't open a newspaper and find a job or go on to the net or whatnot. So I'm good as I'm as good as my last job. Um, and social media helps me a lot just in terms of getting my work out there. So it's a great tool for me. Every set design that I do, I'll post pictures. I'll also just advertise the show and try and encourage people to go and watch it. Um, and it really, really helps. A lot of my jobs I've received from someone saying, hey, uh, there's a producer or a director who referred you. Or I saw a post on Facebook, or on Instagram with your work. Um, so it's quite a huge tool. I generally share my things on social media because it's really the, the easiest free mode that I can use to get a little bit of exposure um, and to get new clients um, on board. Uh, yeah, and then just in terms of protecting my time, I'm just like Balakane, I'm a planner. And because I work, because, you know, um, set design is high pressure in most cases, you can't really afford not to be a planner you know what i mean you sometimes you need to order things in advance sometimes you know what i mean you 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 need to even though you have maybe four weeks the thing needs to be ready in three weeks because you need to give people an opportunity um to do other uh, uh, to rehearse on the stage or whatnot so um i am very very organized and i've learned i mean i've been doing this for about 15 years now so at this stage it's 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 very easy for me to calculate how much time i need to do certain things and to just pace my time. And I work with people because I have a full-time job. I work in a team yeah. standard. So I yeah. have a business partner. Her name is Ntabisang Makoni. We run a company called Production Design Factory. Everything I do, I do it with her. So that if I'm not able to be there, she's able to be there. And we don't have days where there's no work that's done. Thank you. Um, I see we have a question from the audience here. Um, it's from Yusra. She's asking, how do you work together as sisters? Do you get along? Do you help each other out? What kind of feedback do you give each other? Is it kind? <laughs> Yusra. Wow. I feel like that is it kind. It's for me. <laughs> you know, like if I think about it, I was kind of like, because I saw, like I saw the question pop up. And we actually don't work together. And I, I don't Not know Not a lot. Why. Yeah, we don't really. Yeah. It comes out because obviously we're both like very creative people, both very visual people. And we, um, so I think it comes out a lot more in lived experience rather than like formally working together. Like, for example, we both have, although different, but very refined forms of taste. So, you know, maybe we'll be like at a restaurant or at a mall, even like in each other's home spaces and there's sort of like comments or feedback or improvements or approval or whatever in terms of like what's around. We're both very, I mean, especially Karabo being a set designer, we're both very much like space orientated and the kind of experiences that a space facilitates. So I think we do kind of, um, you know, intermingle in that area. And then I think like, funny enough, music, I think we connect because we music. We have a playlist together. We have a playlist together on Spotify. <laughs> So, and it's it's also like the kind of playlist it is and the kind of music that we share specifically on that playlist is very like emotive music. It's very like, you know, it's music that inspires me creatively. So I think that's kind of an unconventional, non sort of practice related way that we share our creativity. It's more in lived experience. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have also, it. it's, you know, if when the opportunity arises for us to do something together, we jump and we do it. This like is now. an opportunity. Um, but we have actually worked on a production together a few years ago. We worked on Lebo Mashile's um, Venus versus oh Modernity. And what I did is I designed the AV um, for, for that production. And then I commissioned Balagani to come in as a visual artist to create original images. So there were images that we 
We, uh, there were images that Balagani illustrated and drew from scratch that we used throughout that thing. But we also recreated certain images. So we had a photo shoot together. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember we there was an image the with, our, and... with the Bible and a gun. <laughs> so we put our, 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 but the Bible that was at home and our father's gun there. And we named that image our father's gun. So when we... When the opportunity does arise for us to work together, we yeah. do work together. And I mean, we do support each other quite a lot in our creativity. So what we'll do is we will, um, for example, I've, I've had, I don't think, I've probably missed one or two of Balagani's exhibitions. And I mean, she's been exhibiting for what, oh, more than five years now, yeah, I think. Like I mean, I heard her earlier on saying she's at the beginning of her career and I was like, what? <laughs> Um, that's not true, but yeah, so we support each other, but the, but even though we're both visual artists, the mediums and the things that we do are so far removed, mm. but whenever there is an opportunity for us to work together, we do. Mm. And just to answer the last question, we are very kind to each other. Yusra. <laughs> we, are. we are, we actually really, really get along. There's an eight year age gap between Palagani <laughs> and I, we have another sister in between us and, um, yeah, yeah we, we do, we get, we get along quite well. Especially the older mm. we get. Yeah, um, we could um, just go through the last two questions and then we'll go on to the first clip uh, by Maria Paolo Um uh, Yeah, uh, the question being, is your family artistic or is it just the two of you that are in the arts? So, yeah, like it's just the two of us that are in the arts, but like our dad, for example, is really good at drawing, like especially observational drawing. I mean, he didn't really pursue that as like a career path, but I think there is, you know, that that aspect there. Our late grandmother was like really into sewing and like, you know, like making little garments or fixing some of our stuff. So she kind of had that. Our mom gardens and is incredibly creative in the kitchen when it comes and to design, and like design, just in terms yeah. of spatial design, design and yeah. like fashion clothes, putting things together. So there is, there is very much, um, there's a lot of creative expression. And like, you know, we super blessed in terms of the fact that we were very much encouraged in our creativity growing up. It was never shunned when Garab and I, you know, would say like, oh, we want to go to art school. We want to pursue art In fact, careers. my parents took me to art school. Yeah. I didn't know oh. that. Yeah, I didn't know. I went to the National School of Arts and like my parents, I don't know. I wasn't doing so well in the other school, not academically per se, but like um, in terms of fitting in and adjusting. And they were like, hey, there's an art school in Joburg. Do you want to go? And I was like, sure. So, you know, we've been really, really lucky in the yeah. sense that we come from a family where our parents kind of picked up on our strengths, all of their children. Mm. And they were like, you're really good with this. Let's do this. But also, I mean, growing up, I went to music school from when I was like seven to like 15, 16. I used to play the violin. Our other sister, who's not here, Petoho, also went to music school. She used to play the violin. We used to do talent competitions. So just through growing up throughout our childhood, Very our parents encouraged. did kind of encourage us and push us into, yeah. not just necessarily push us into the arts, but push us into doing what we're good at. Yeah. yeah. And Barry were incredibly supportive. Like there was not a single time where I felt, oh, maybe let me do chemistry or whatever. Like they never felt made us feel somehow and and not a lot of kids get that still, no, no guys, and no. they're still no. so supportive really to this yeah. day the level yeah. of support is like 100 thank you um okay last question uh it's there are too many barrier barriers to entry of the set design market how does one establish and market themselves as set designers also how important is it for self-taught independent set designers to get formal education? I mean, that's that's an artist's question yeah, right true. there. Do I go to school for it? That is so, that is so tough. Um, like I said, I, I get my production design work from um, already existing clients, from people who already know me. I do a lot of work with the market theater, quite a lot. I do a lot of design work at UJ Arts and Culture as well. Um, and I work with independent uh, productions. And really, I 
Yeah, I just kind of, I got my first break from my lecture. I, I, I studied uh, set design at WITS and I got my first break from my lecturer, Sarah Roberts, who hooked me up with a job with the Dance Factory when Dada Masilo was doing Romeo and Juliet. And then I worked with Dada for a few years and then I designed things for her and then I started working with the market. So it's really, really tough. I, what I can say is I have worked with other younger designer. The Market Theatre had this mentorship program where every time they give me like a young designer to work with and then I'd hook them up and one or two of them are actually doing really well right now. And I'm not attributing it because of me, but um, I, do you know what I mean? I am proud of them in the sense that yeah. they were my protégés for a bit and then they kind of like, you know, flew into the thing. But it's very, it. very hard to get into the industry. It's very, very competitive as well. It's also like it's... A, I would say my advice to you is that if you're a young set designer and you're trying to get in, speak to somebody who is already a practicing set designer, because that's also how I got my break. My teacher had a job that she couldn't do. So she passed it over to me. You know what I mean? So find an established and um, busy set designer, speak to them and assist them. Start as assisting them just to learn the ropes and whatever. And eventually when that person trusts you, they will pass jobs to you because with me, um, the person who I'm referring to, I, I, I would then pass jobs to her afterwards, you know, um, because I trusted her. I knew she was trained. She was really, really good. Um, and I knew that, you know, the quality of her work would be great. In terms of studying production design, that's also a really, really tough one because it's usually an undergrad course. You have to go to like university to do it or like an after college type thing. Um, so I don't know. I, I know that sometimes, um, certain theaters or production companies will do like master classes with production designers, uh, to train people. Um, but I don't know of anything that's not like as formal as like an undergrad in university of space where you can do this thing. So, um, it's also a very, very tough one. It's so niche. It's so niche. It's so small. The group is really, really small. There's like few of us. Um, but my best advice there is find a, find a set designer who's generous and who's willing to share with you and then stick to them. And eventually um, you'll start, you know, getting your own feet. Uh, thank you. Um, hopefully, Gamgelo, that answers your question. Uh, next, we'll play Maria Palo's uh, McGurk's video. Um, and hopefully um, that could continue and um, carry on our conversation. Hi there, my name is Maria Paula McGurk. I am a paper cutting visual artist. I work mainly in large sheets of black paper, which I then finally cut out. You know, concept development is, is, is the heart of what visual arts is. Without concept, it is, it is meaningless, it has no depth. But that is not to say that concept has to be pre-decided and has to be, you have to have this brilliant um, conceptual narrative that goes with the work. You know, you're not, you're not a poet, you're not, an art, you're not a writer, you're a visual artist. So to me, the works have to speak visually. They have to um, speak to people on a deeper level visually. Um, no artist has works that all of their works speak to everybody. You know, your, your artwork will speak to some and others just will not be drawn to it. The trick, from my perspective, is to be able to develop your skill to a level that you can speak in a way that is true for you. Uh, that's taken me 20 years to achieve. I started off for the first 10 years of my career as a painter. And I used to keep visual diaries and I kept lots and lots of sketches and drawings and they just did not work in the medium of paint. And it was only when I started working in paper cutting that this very bold, flat, graphic style of work fitted so well with this medium of paper cutting. But it's taken 10 years to learn how to paper cut well. So, so my advice to young creatives, young visual artists is be critical thinkers, be aware of the world you live in, be aware of your perspective, um, and continually be challenging your perspective. Always have visual diaries on you, always be sketching and drawing, and spend, spend hours and hours and hours in your studio, which could be a room, it could be a desk, it really doesn't matter, practicing 
and making and making. In essence, you are a maker. And the, the better your skill is, the, the better your, your tool to speak to others will be. I, I'm not a fan of subcontracting work to others who have the skill. To me, the, the, the real magic of being a visual artist is in the process of making the mistakes that you have to deal with, the, the explorations that happen in the studio. So concepts to me is, is critical and is aligned directly with skill development. Cool man, ciao. Thank you to MP. Uh, ladies, what are your thoughts? Absolutely, absolutely agree with her. I actually personally know um, Maria Paolo. I'm a huge fan of her work. I actually have a portrait, a self-portrait right here. Um, I'll, when Balagani speaks, I'll fetch it and I'll just show everyone. But I completely agree with her. And um, it is the biggest challenge. There's, there's a part there where she said that, um, you know, it, it has to speak to people like visually, you know what I mean? Because because it's not a performance or something like that, you don't kind of have the privilege of saying a poem and expressing exactly what it is that you want to express when it's with an image or, uh, you know what I mean? I mean, even, even, even with a set design, for me, when I design a set, if it's like a room in an apartment, it's not just a room in an apartment for me. Everything is thought out from, from every single book on the shelf to the size of the book to what color the book is. Like I'm very pedantic about color palette. So if I have four colors, even if you look at every bookshelf on my set, it's only gonna have those four colors because you know what I mean? It's, it's our job to put the meaning and the details into what everybody's visually seeing. Yeah, I 1050% agree with Mar what Maria was saying as well, like in terms of the importance of, um, for me personally, like I do think technical kill, kill, technical skill is important. And like what I, in more recent works, this is something that's only sort of come to the forefront for me now, but to have people walk in and like immediately just be taken aback by the beauty of the work or you know with like the intensity of the work whatever it's trying to portray so like if you think of like penny siopus's work for example i mean personally i wouldn't say it's like oh my gosh so pretty it's very like intense and striking it's gory it's dark it kind of makes you want to like gag a little bit and to me that is successful work because it's like portraying a very powerful emotion. So I think to really be able to grab people's attention visually, and then also in terms of like concept and explanation, I feel like, you know, especially as like time has gone on, has gone on. And again, like just want to preface with the fact that I really respect academia and intense like study of works and stuff. But for me, it's, you know, kind of intense art jargon and you know, flowery words and statements, like really laden exhibition statements, they don't really do a lot for me personally. Even when I write about my work or write exhibition statements, it's really simple. Just a couple of sentences explaining what I like to say. The most important thing for me is to like reach people. And I think it is leveraging between like reaching and speaking to people and then like expressing yourself and like your concepts and the deep intensities and stuff and you know all the complex stuff that no one understands trying to like meet in the middle of those two um planes which I think is very it's it's quite the challenge but I think for me that's when things become successful when my mom who you know, doesn't have an intense formal background or my grandmother or my three-year-old nephew and my friend who's doing PhD in art, if they can come and like all connect with the piece, I think that's, you know, that's something, that's something good for me. Here's the piece. By Maria Paolo. It's by Maria Paolo. It's absolutely beautiful. Like, I don't know if you guys could see it. 
you can see that it's me. I think she's incredibly talented. I like crazy talented. Um, and also even with this visually, like she literally just captured the mood that I was in. Um, if you see the original picture, um, but yeah. Yeah. Sorry, thank I'm you, guys. ladies, and uh, thank you to MP. Um, there was actually a quote earlier, um, her quote, and I really loved it. She said, Within my works, you will find me, and I found that so like moving because yeah, that's, that's what's so art supposed to be. It's supposed to like evoke emotion to like your everyday people, and um, I feel like every artist should strive to do that. So um, thanks to you, MP. Uh, we have more questions coming up. So I think we'll just um, do those. Um, there's a question from Ryan. He says, um, hello, fantastic chat so far. How do you know if your artwork is done? And how do you know when to stop developing the work? I'm never done. I, when I do a set work, I, I think I'm, I'm one of those annoying set designers. I, I change. I think it also has to do with the fact that maybe I'm a Gemini. So like, you know, I change my mind quite a lot. So every single day, it's a process until the show opens. So my job as a set designer finishes on the day of opening night, but still on that day I go, you know, I'll, I'll, even if it's just swapping the blue book and the black book, you know what I mean? And like, I so my work is done because the show is open and I'm not allowed to go in and like do anything. But really how I feel is that the work is never done. If if yeah. if there weren't any boundaries and I could go in, I'd probably go every second day and swap a book and move something. So it's really, really hard. I know it's done because they like you can't come in, ma'am. <laughs> I'm the complete opposite. Like works get done, guys. When it stresses me out, then it's finished. Um, if it's got a focal point and like a background and stuff, then if it's starting to like get too intense, then it's finished. I really am like trying to develop a, a very like healthy dynamic with my practice because art making can be quite volatile yes like, and it can make you anxious it can make you anxious yeah. you can like so i'm just really trying to like self-regulate within you know if it's going to be my career and if it's going to be my work and i'm in this thing for the long haul i really need to like self-regulate it can't be as volatile as it is that being said sometimes i do like ask for advice i have my best friend uh, neil who is also an artist and illustrator. And there are times when I'm not sure, like I'll show him, I'll be like, yo, bro, do you think this is done? And then he'll be like, ah, oh, at a focal point, at this and that. But I sometimes um, often rather opt to put work away for a little bit, whether it be a day, a week or a month, and then revisit it. And then, you know, sometimes getting to the point of is it done is a process in the sense that I may not even touch it again. But after I've thought about it and looked at it for three days and I'm kind of satisfied with it, then like it's done. But works get done. I don't like to fiddle too like long and intensely. Um, oh, sorry. Wrong question. Thanks, ladies. Um, a Piwe Moyo asks, at one point, do you consider yourself a professional visual artist? <laughs> I considered myself a professional set designer when I started getting paid for it. Um, okay, maybe not my first, first job, because I actually started working. I got my first job when I was in third year. I designed... I art directed um, two children's show for GUI, which was a channel on Mnet. Um, but really, I would say from when when people start seeing value in your thing, as soon as I'm getting paid to do the work, then I'm a professional. And I feel like generally, that's that's really that should be the ballpark. It doesn't mean you're good. It doesn't mean you're great. But I feel like when people are starting to put money into it, then you're working. And professional for me gives the connotation of working. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I agree with you to an extent. I think it's very much a, it's a very semantic thing, I think, and it's up to interpretation. So in a like everyday 
the way we see and understand the world and relate to each other, then, you know, sure thing, I'm a professional artist. But the way that I view and consider myself, my practice and my relationship to my practice, I don't really think of myself as a professional artist. I kind of just think of myself more as like a kid or like a tinkerer because I just feel like if I allow myself to fully, um, you know, take on that title, it somehow internally limits me to like being open to like maybe deeply open to learning because it's like, well, I'm a professional. I can do this. I know, you know, I know what works. I know what sells for me, whatever. But for me, I, I, I don't really see myself as that. I just see myself as a, an explorer and, you know, the realm of art happens to be the space in which I'm exploring. But I really approach it as if I'm like three years old. And there's still so much to learn. I do. I just want to add something that I don't agree with Palikana on, which is okay. Yeah. Um, is that for me, there's there's a difference between a prof being a professional something and being an expert. You understand? Mm -hmm. As a professional set designer, I don't consider myself an expert, you know, I don't feel like there's no, that I've reached somewhere and like, I can't learn from anything. Every single production that I do is different. So the challenges are different and it's scary in that sense. Um, so I don't feel like, but I do consider myself a professional, you know, and conduct myself like a professional. Um, yeah, but, but like, I don't think I'm an expert. I do think there's, there's so much more for me to learn. I think, and in connection to what she's just said, I think it just, Again, it's such a, I feel like it's a thing of semantics mm, because definitely. you, this is what you, you kind of brought in the language of, of experts and I kind of lumped that in with professionals. So mm. I think it, yeah, mm. yeah, I think we very much in line, but it's semantic differences. Um, thank you, ladies. Um, okay, so I want to ask you now. I don't know if I should ask you this in the next uh, video. Another one to the questions. I'm going to ask you this last question and then we'll play uh, a video by. <laughs> don't laugh. And then we'll play a video no, no, by. No, 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 uh, and then we'll play a video by Monli, the artivist Kunene. But for now, uh, I wanted to know uh, what have you learned in your career that you can pass on um, to less experienced artists? Do you want to go first? If there was one thing. Um, you really, really need to know your worth. Nobody's going to do that for you. You know what I mean? If, if, if my rate is 100 rand... I really, really need to push that 100 rand. And I'm not saying that you mustn't be open to negotiation. I negotiate all the time with producers, but I'm very clear about my minimum, you know, and I'm very clear. And for me to do a job with my minimum, I really need to like the job. I need to like you as the director or the producer. I need to read the script and go, oh my God. Or it needs to be one of those stories where I'm like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. But really, I think you need to know your worth and you need to know you're worth even in terms of money, like what, like what, what you are creating, what it is worth. It's, it's, you're the only person who can do that for yourself. And if you don't see it, nobody else is going to see it. Yeah. yeah like that is literally what she's just said is in my opinion, gospel, if you're going to be in the creative industry and it is a lot more difficult than it sounds. Yeah. Like it sounds like, oh, I know I can know. It is so, so difficult. There are so many things that are going to be thrown in your direction that will make you want to compromise on your worth. And just understanding that the minute you do that, there, there is so much at stake in that we are working in an industry. And the minute you start to engage in like self-exploitation in that way then you also like bringing down this the, the like financial standard of like the industry of what other people absolutely can charge so it's it's a kind of a responsibility thing as well and then from my side uh in terms of my industry specifically visual art networking is like super duper important it's very much and like your pictures are like 
40% and then the rest of the 60% is how you can speak about your work, how you can market your work, the connections that you make. It is so important to go to exhibitions. It's so important to go to openings, to go to walkabouts, to talk to people. Um, it's just, it really is a lot about who you know, the connections you can make, how well you can articulate yourself and then just consistency, keep practicing, keep making work, learn like, I don't want to say play the game because that sounds a little bit like it has a, like some malicious intent. Play but, the game. No, know, know the dance. Like, know the dance. Like, don't sit there in the corner and be like, oh, this is my picture. Like, <laughs> really, like, punch your work, guys. There are people out there who are making like really subpar artworks, but they, they're big here and it shows it here. It. Mm. So like really believe again, it go, ties in with what she says, believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, other people will be, believe in you. It's such a, it's such a, 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 an industry that relies so much on charisma. Like you, you don't even realize how important that is. Yeah. That's yeah. what I would say. I agree with her. Networking is probably how I get 99% of yeah. my work. I'll be at an opening uh, then the director will be like, let me introduce you to this person. Oh, this is Garabo. She's the set oh, yeah. designer. Then I am here. Oh, yeah, no, this set, this was the challenge. I loved this and I didn't like this and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Because also it's about clicking with people, right? Like they can, you can see my work and be like, that set is amazing. And then when we meet, I'm awkward or I'm weird or I'm in a bad mood and whatnot. Then you're just like, hey, mm -mm. She yeah. might be good, but wow, she doesn't seem like a fun person to work yeah. with or whatnot. So absolutely. And it's like in relation to what you were saying, it's really a skill, guys. Like you must really know like how to schmooze. You know, you can't be there, meet someone. Oh, please try my pictures. Like build a little bit of a relationship. Like, you know, meet people a few times or whatever. Like don't just like... Be strict. Sometimes you can just bring yourself up, but it's it's about like just not being sensitive to little nuances and being strategic in terms of timing and how you present yourself. It's really, it's like, it's a skill that you just develop over time. Like it's, it's, yeah. yeah. Thank you, lady. Gamo here saying there was this time when an actor pushed the set so hard it fell during the opening night how is your process of quality control and most importantly adhering to safety and healthy measures for users of the world built honestly that is number one on my list health and safety i always say sometimes a director will ask me for something where i'm like that's dangerous or that's crazy and i'll say to them and i you know that what you're suggesting could be a career destroying move you know what i mean literally so health and safety is very very important um and just testing things out and that's why like when I use professional set builders, you know what I mean? If the budget is small, then I won't design something that's elaborate because I know that if we're going to, we can't build a balcony with like a short budget because if an actor falls and hurts themselves, that's my career. You know what I mean? If, if, if anything happens to anyone and you know what I mean, that's my career. If I do build something that has a balcony or a floor, I get a professional set builder in who like, sometimes it has to be approved by an engineer. It depends on what the theater is. It depends. Do you know what I mean? So for me, that's very, very important because I also don't want that on my, on my conscience. I don't want anyone to fall off a set and break their thing and then it destroys their career. Um, so for me, it's really, it is number one. Um, but it also, it's up to the producers, you know what I mean? And um, the directors, you know, to also come in and to be like, okay, is this safe? Um, and, but with that said, I can design the safest set ever. And then the director comes in and tells the actor to jump from the second floor to the bottom. Do you understand what I mean? And in a case like that, I don't have any directorial input. I can't tell them, you know, I will advise. I'll be like, hey, I don't think that's a good idea. They're going to break their face. But after that, what I'll do is I'll send the producer an email and I'll be like, dear producer, I was sitting in a run today and I saw that they're jumping from the second balcony and whatnot. Just so we are clear, I did not design the set so that that can happen. I didn't put a cushion on the floor for the landing and whatnot and whatnot. So I also cover myself so that if, if anything ever happens, no one's going to come to me and try and sue me. If anyone talks 
crap about me on social media. I'm going to fetch them because I know that I've covered myself and I've warned people to be like, this thing was not designed to do that. And I don't advise that you function with it like that. But absolutely, I think it's hella embarrassing. I can't, I cannot imagine. I would just like bash myself against the wall if I was sitting in the audience and my set fell over. But that's why you need to test things. That's why you need to. And that usually also happens on last minute things where the actors didn't have enough time to rehearse because if, if, if that could have happened in a technical run or a FDR or something. So that's why you need to do things in time. You remember in, I think my very, very first comment, I spoke about how then you need to give the people time to work in the space. You know what I mean? Because then what's the point of having this elaborate set and then they don't use it because they didn't have enough time. But yes, health and safety is really, really on top of my list. I, I, I'm also a producer by profession, so I'm very pedantic about that in particular. Thank you. Um, That's the question I was laughing at earlier. Wow. <laughs> no, I'm not laughing. Okay, I think we should go on to Mwendli, the artist Kunene's um, video. Uh, yes, uh, please, Bash. Hello world, I am Mondi, the activist Gunene from Delside Renval, and I create one of one high quality thought provoking paintings to raise awareness about social contentious issues within the African diaspora and how those issues resonate to the rest of the world. I might see here or think about a social issue and then I create an artwork or artworks within a week about that issue. My favorite place to source ideas is hip hop, life experiences because I create artworks as social commentary. And unusual places to source some ideas are other artists' artwork, but I use permission first before I can utilize the artwork. When I'm commissioned, it's very important that I listen to the client's needs. Thereafter, I'll play the music that pertains to the subject that I need to paint about. I do not, however, um, have creative burnout. This is because I listen to my body and I'm in tune with it. When I'm tired, I'm tired. However, if an idea comes through, I'll jot it down. With regards to unusual art pieces, uh, I've created the Cash Cow, the New Sleeves, and hashtag Nitiubano Captured, which is six years old but still relevant today. Because we are taught that art is subjective, I prefer creating art that is both subjective and objective. This then changes and adds a unique blend to my work, which makes it stand out from everyone. In a sense that it questions, while it, un uh, while it also answers um, some of the questions that are pertaining to everyday life, regardless whether you are in South Africa or around the world. This means that I create work that you can that can make you think for yourself while you can also go out and research the information that I'm talking about for yourself. And most importantly, apply logic. Thank you. Hashtag Mondly Art. Thank you. Thank you to Mondly uh, for that contribution to our panel discussions. Ladies, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I really um, enjoyed um, kind of Monty's perspectives. Um, I, yeah, I like the fact that, you know, he kind of spoke about his, the, the like socio-political nature of his work and how it's to, um, like, you know, kind of, yeah, br to bring forth social political causes. And I think that's so important in this country with the very intense history that we have. I mean, we just shy of 30 years out of apartheid. So it's something that um, still needs to be in the, at the forefront. And, you know, spaces like the Zeitzmacher is so important in terms of bringing those voices, bringing Black voices to the forefront in terms of discussing these issues. And it's also really like, uh, refreshing to see like people taking this on within their practices, expressing it in um, various different ways. And also like his allusion to um, that relationship between subjectivity and object and like being subjective and being objective. I think yeah. Maria also touched on it a little bit earlier on. And we both also spoke about how like you kind of have to meet in the middle, like, yes, you know, you, 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 
portraying like your your self expression but at the end of the day we're also relational beings and we need to um and we're showing works in a space where everybody's going to engage with it so we need to be able to not only express ourselves but also draw people in absolutely i mean i support everything that balagan has said um and also i think you know part of our jobs as artists is to also teach you know um i in the last production that i did it was a collaboration with the bielefeld opera house in germany and we did a production at the market theater and in germany two sets same director same show it was a love story of two people who were having a relationship online and the character uh, the flat belonged to a female she was from zimbabwe she was quite a revolutionary she was super woke um and i you know and i used that as an opportunity to find out who are like the female struggle heroes in zim because really we know who all the men are you know what i mean but in zimbabwe in particular i was like i actually don't even know one female struggle hero so i had to go and look for those people and print posters of them and look them up and stick them up and i felt like it as the set designer it was my responsibility to bring that forth so that when the audience walks in they must ask who who is that you know what i mean and like hopefully it will like encourage them to go and look I really love what Monty said about how he doesn't suffer from burnout because he listens to his body um because it's it's that's a really really good skill and it's something that even 15 years in, into practice I'm still teaching and learning myself as uh, as Balagan mentioned earlier, it's so difficult to turn down jobs you know what I mean because sometimes you don't even know when the next one will come um but it is important to listen to your body because i burn out every year um in fact it's almost scheduled sometimes um but uh you know what i mean i i thought that 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 really gave me a lot to think about that actually he's so right about listening to your body and mm. making sure that you know what i mean you don't burn yourself out including burning yourself out creatively thank you ladies um so we have less than 10 minutes left i think we have uh, time for about two more questions and then we'll be wrapping it up. So um, my first question is, who are the people you allow into your creative process and why? Okay, so for me, I don't really allow anyone into my creative process deeply, intimately. It's a very personal thing. I mean, I would say you know, I guess maybe references of artists that I'm studying or or like genres or periods that I'm studying, but I don't like formally engage converse, like conversationally. Sometimes I'll like create works and then show people before exhibition and maybe ask, you know, like what they think or feel about the work, but during the process, not much. I do, there are like exceptions though, as I said earlier on my best friend, Neil, who's also a visual artist, sometimes like mid work, I'll be like, yo bro, this image is unresolved, please help me. But generally I, it's just me and uh, whatever references I'm looking at and, and nature. I guess if, if that the force that I really allow to inspire me is the natural world. I'm the exact opposite of that. Um, the My process is very, very collaborative for many, many reasons. As I mentioned, I have a business partner who I work with, so I speak to her quite a lot. Sometimes I have to resolve problems. Like, for example, the last uh, thing that I designed was an opera. So in an opera there was a live band that was there and we, you know, I had to figure out where to put the conductor on the set because the singers need to see the conductor and they are on stage and the musicians were behind them, you know? So I, so I called in one or two people who've done this before and been like, you know, can you help me? How do we resolve this? I also work with a crew. Um, there are a few set builders that I work with who are amazing. And I'll sit down with them sometimes and I'll be like, what do you think? Does this make sense? Um, so I, I do. And then I'll allow the director to come in and I'll be like, okay, do you like this? Should we change this? Is this practical? So with my work, it helps me quite a lot to bring other people in because many times they'll show me that that's not practical or that door shouldn't be there. It should be on the other side. Um, so I allow people into my process quite a lot because I create worlds that people exist in. So it helps to get other opinions of people of that world. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Um, so the next question is, 
What are visual pieces made? Uh, you go first. Um, the, the opera that I mentioned now, it was quite a first. I'd never designed an opera before. Um, uh, last year, uh, we, this year at UJ Arts and Culture, we'll be doing a piece called M Macabre that we uh, premiered last year at the Free State Arts Festival. It's happening in the first week of June. Um, and with Macabre, it's a site, it's more of a site-specific thing. So it's kind of a piece, it's quite a grim piece that's yeah. set in a house, you know, and it has to be in a house and not in a theater. So that was very interesting, like kind of navigating around the restrictions of being in a house and what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and yeah, I've done one or two abstract pieces um, that were quite challenging and quite unusual. Um, but for the most part, it's, I'm really, really quite restricted by the set. I mean, by the script and what the yeah. story requires. Unusual. Um, I think maybe not so much like unusual work, I don't think, but maybe can I say that I've engaged in unusual processes in like creating works. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, like just tinkering and experimentation is a really big part of my process so I don't know there's been times where you know I would have pens or whatever in both hands and like close my eyes and do blind drawings or really allowing like the work of my like the music whatever I'm listening to just like deeply focusing on that and um trying my best to kind of channel and permeate that in the work I view my practice as not separate from my life in the sense that I just, I feel every everything in my life is very interconnect, interconnected. So I'm a very like sporty person. I run a lot and, you know, in my running practice now, for example, I'm going through a very, you know, it used to be very intense, supercharged, loud music, run fast, whatever. Now I'm going through a very introspective, process in my running practice where I'm not listening to music I'm doing a lot of experimentations where you know I'll run in a loop and I'll like soft focus my eyes and I'll like really just focus on the pacing and get into this very zen dreamlike state and then see how that influences my artwork so I do engage in you know, on the surface, unusual processes in in terms of like how I create my work, but I don't think any of my work's necessarily unusual. She's really, really deep. When I run, I'm like, stop at the stop sign. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like very zen. Yeah, I'm like, chakra hand. Um, the zen. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you, ladies, for um, tuning in and being here today. Thank you for giving us um, your time. We learned so much um, from you. Very inspired by you. It was very nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. To the audience, I really hope that you, you took something from these ladies. And um, yeah, good luck on your future projects. Um, thank you. Years. And in the behalf of the Center of Creative Arts, Sports Creative Arts, and the Affluence um, Festival, uh, we thank you. Thank, thank you, you so yeah. much. We it was appreciate wonderful. It. Yeah. yeah, it's an Absolutely honor to have it. been invited on and invited on together. We're very grateful for yes, that. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.